My name is David Keller. We are going to conclude our series of short lectures on ethics by looking at the virtue ethics of moral psychologist Carol Gilligan. Gilligan's ethical theory is an example of feminist virtue ethics. Carol Gilligan is a moral uh, psychologist currently teaching at Harvard. And of all the thinkers that we have uh, looked at in this short uh, series of, of lectures, she is the one person that I have actually met, and it was an honor meeting her. <clears throat> Before we look in detail at her, her contribution to ethics, we need to define feminism, because I have claimed that her theory is an example of feminist virtue ethics, or ethics which focuses on the character, the disposition, the personality of the morally good person, rather than outlining uh, rules uh, as exemplified by Mill and Kant. Feminism, according to me, is the assertion that there have been and still are socio-cultural structures which have impeded or restricted the development of women and that these structures ought to be dismantled. It is this ought in the phrase, these structures ought to be dismantled that makes feminism an ethical theory. To understand Gilligan's theory, we must first understand the difference between the terms sex and gender, terms that you will notice in everyday discourse and in the media um, are, are generally equivocated, but for our purposes here as scholars, as academics, we must be very careful to distinguish. The term sex is a biological term. In human beings, it means that the nucleus of each cell contains 22 paired chromosomes and two sex chromosomes. So in human beings, Males have a paired set of chromosomes X, Y, and females have X, X. The point here is that sex is, technically speaking, a biological term. Gender, on the other hand, is a social term, and it is the words masculine and feminine, which are gender terms and which are not biological terms. Why do I say this? Because gender arises through a socialization process. If things go as planned in our culture, biological males should become masculine, and biological females should become feminine. But as we all know, there is nothing necessary about this connection. There are some biological males that exib exhibit feminine attributes, and there are some biological females which exhibit masculine attributes. In other words, there is nothing embedded in our actual DNA that determines whether we should become masculine or feminine. It's a socialization process. <clears throat> Take me, for example. I uh, appear, uh, to the best of my ability, masculine in the clothes I wear and the kind of haircut I have and so on and so forth. I did not wear a dress to stand in front of the camera. Uh, I don't have a ribbons in my hair. Um, and I actually uh, went to the effort to get a haircut before taping these lectures uh, so my hair wouldn't be too long. 
In other words, I have made some kind of effort uh, primarily because of uh, social pressure to look a certain way, look conventional, look masculine. And this, this socialization process of gender is central to Carol Gilligan's ethical theory. Gilligan's central contribution to ethics is that this engendering process, which is a social process, has ethical implications. Specifically, Gilligan argues that there are in fact two moral psychologies in our culture, two systems, one masculine, one feminine, and that women have traditionally been judged according to the standards of the masculine system and have been underrated as a consequence and that this is unethical. Gilligan argues in her famous book, In a Different Voice, published in the early 1980s, that traditional moral psychology, based on the work of her mentor at Harvard, Lawrence Kohlberg, is very Kantian in orientation and that Kohlberg scale has been used to judge the moral sophistication of women. Women have come out underrated on this system and that it's not a problem with the moral sophistication of women that is revealed in this. It's that the, 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 the wrong system has been used to judge women and that is a masculine system. Kohlberg argued that um, there is a scale of moral sophistication, a hierarchy, and Kohlberg argued that um, the lowest form of moral sophistication is pure deference to authority. Secondly, a slightly higher level of moral sophistication is when one learns to satisfy one's own needs uh, and then begin to satisfy, uh, consider the needs of others. So uh, you begin to become aware of a social context. The third level for Kohlberg is when a person uh, seeks approval uh, by conforming to stereotyped rules. Fourthly, for Kohlberg, conformity is augmented by a sense of goodness in maintaining social order. Fifthly, a higher level of sophistication is reached when one begins to associate morality with rights and standards endorsed by society as a whole. This makes me think of rule, the rule ethic approach uh, to John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism. But then Kohlberg argues that the highest level of moral sophistication is when a person begins to generate self-chosen universal principles of justice and look beyond the social framework. This is clearly very Kantian, reminiscent of the categorical imperative and the process of universalization uh, that we looked at in la the last lecture. So the gist of Kohlberg's scale here is that the lowest levels of moral sophistication are based on making moral judgments according to social context deference to authority, social acceptance, and so forth, while the highest forms of moral sophistication are the ability to make judgments based on totally abstract principles, such as the categorical imperative, independently of social context. Kohlberg, as an empirical social scientist, concluded upon doing his research, which included, incidentally, boys, uh, that um, 
that men, based on this very Kantian-inspired scale, are much more morally superior than women, girls and women. Gilligan's work is largely a reaction to the moral psychology of Lawrence Kohlberg. Gilligan argues that Kohlberg's moral psychology is seriously flawed because women and girls are being judged on a criteria that in our culture is masculine. Gilligan argues in uh, her famous book, In a Different Voice, that therefore a problem in psychology and psychological theory has been misinterpreted as a problem in human development, specifically female human development. The problem is, uh, for Gilligan is that there has only been one theoretical apparatus to evaluate two distinct psychologies of gender. Her central thesis is that we need a second moral psychology to do justice to the feminine perspective. In order to accomplish uh, this, Gilligan uh, looks at the different ways that, that, that men and women, boys and girls, are engendered in the socialization process. What are the differences in our culture between masculinity and femininity? As an empirical social scientist, Gilligan looks to childhood games. She notices that uh, boys' games are typically games of competition. Uh, ball games, running, jumping, scoring, etc., which uh, in which victory is always gained at the expense or the loss of somebody else. Victory entails defeat. Boys' games are inherently competitive. Look at girls' games. Girls' games, Gilligan says, are not this way at all. They generally are games of cooperation, which are not overtly competitive. Uh, dollhouse, uh, dress-up and role-playing games don't have clear winners and losers. Uh, no one is victorious in, uh, in an afternoon uh, playing dollhouse, for example. For Gilligan, as an empirical social scientist, these games provide a window into the socially constructed psychologies of masculinity and femininity. The masculine psychology, Gilligan says, in the masculine psychology for Gilligan, men are like inert atoms bumping and colliding with each other in the game of life. Some individuals get knocked out of the game um, and some individuals persist and are victorious. On this model of inert, discrete selves, uh, selves come into relationships and go out of relationships, or to put it another way, the selves have relationships. This psychology, this masculine psychology, is clearly a good psychology for free market economics, in which you go out into the marketplace, you compete, and there are winners and there are losers. The feminine psychology, on the other hand, is very different. Uh, on the feminine psychology, Gilligan argues, uh, individuals are considered to be embedded 
in web works of relationships of mutual interdependence. So while on the masculine model we just said the self has relationships, on the feminine model the self is relationships. On the feminine model selves are nodes and web works of relationships and the definition of the self is the position in the web work of relationships that one happens to inhabit. As a scholar of the science of ecology it's interesting to note in passing that the feminine notion of selfhood is a very ecological one insofar as it, it emphasizes interdependence and connectedness. The feminine psychology is good for families and it's good for local communities developing and nurturing relationships in the neighborhood, in the church, in the social community. So we have two distinct psychologies, masculine and feminine, which have distinct social functions. The feminine perspective is what Gilligan calls the care perspective and this care perspective in psychology has interesting ethical ramifications. In developing, in, in, in her research and her scholarly work, Gilligan thus provides a second alternative to moral, uh, to Kohlberg's scale of moral development which he intended to be universally applicable to all human beings. So by way of review, what Gil Gilligan is doing is saying that we need a second scale to Kohlberg's masculine one to do justice to the feminine perspective, the care perspective. Gilligan's scale goes something like this. Um, The lowest level of moral sophistication is a survival orientation, that of say a baby, in which uh, the focus is on caring for oneself, crying, getting attention when one is hungry or wants to go to sleep and so forth. A second level of moral sophistication is attained when uh, um, the, the, the individual is still selfish, be, 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 becomes vaguely aware of an orientation in uh, a social context. The third level of moral sophistication for Gilligan is focus on care and conformity. Similar to Kohlberg with a different emphasis on a desire, uh, uh, desiring to please others and to do what is good and care for others. Um, as the individual on the care perspective begun, be, begins to see one's web work and relationships, one realizes that you cannot saf sacrifice oneself entirely to nurture relationships and there is a greater understanding of the connection between the self and others, something of the nature, I'm not different than you, we're connected. We're connected in the social, the same social web work, the same social framework. Then for Gilligan, the highest level of moral sophistication is when care becomes a self-chosen principle, it's a complete recognition and affirmation of the interdependence of all individuals within a web work of relationships. So, um, to recap this scale, for Gilligan, the lowest levels of moral sophistication are based on an egoistic, self-centered gratification, and the highest levels are based on the recognition of an interdependence of individuals
and the affirmation of those relationships. In the care model, empathy and concern for other persons becomes a self-chosen principle of conduct. This principle of conduct is the manifestation of a virtuous character in terms of femininity. This is the ethics of care. Now we can see for Gilligan uh, in concluding that uh, for her there's a gender complementarity that there, there's a, a masculine psychology and a feminine psychology in our culture and each uh, psychology has uh, distinct social functions one for the marketplace one for the home and so in this sense uh, Gilligan's uh, ethics is conservative in affirming the the roles that we each play uh, in a harmonious and just social framework. Her contribution to ethics is the idea that the manifestation of virtuous character is one of care and that it is a feminine perspective but it should not necessarily be uh, restricted to women, that, that, that men like myself um, can exhibit virtuous character insofar as we recognize uh, the interdependence of all selves in a social framework and, and uh, show empathy, concern, and care for other people who are worthy of respect and recognition as uh, moral agents themselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm.